Hello, everyone. This is Louis Marinelli again, the California Secessionist, streaming live on YouTube and Twitter and Facebook on all the platforms that we use at Yes California and that I use personally in pursuance of the great national divorce in the United States. And that's actually what I wanted to continue to talk about today because everyone's talking about national divorce and that's great. It's a national conversation about what needs to happen in this country. And of course there are people on both sides of the issue. Some, many people, many people are for national divorce. Some people are, you know, pretending that they're against it out of some lofty ideas of patriotism and love for country. And some idea that, because we're Americans, we're better than that. You know, it's a bunch of nonsense. In my opinion, we're all going to get to the same result anyway. And that is a national divorce settlement, which separates this country in one way or another so that we can get out of each other's hair, get out of this dysfunctional household and live in peace in North America. That's what the goal of national divorce is. For us to stop interfering with the domestic affairs of each other, of each other's states on the left and on the right, and live in peace in North America. Because I believe, and the supporters of national divorce believe, that if the states, for example, the left and the right, if we separate through national divorce, and for example, the people of Texas are no longer interfering with the domestic affairs of California, and Californians, likewise, are no longer interfering with the domestic affairs of the people of Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Texas, Florida, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Alaska. If, if Californians are no longer, no longer interfering with their domestic affairs, with our ideas and our value system in California, that most of the rest of the country thinks is pretty crazy. So we get out of each other's affairs, domestic affairs. We agree to disagree. We separate peacefully. And then we can actually live together as, as neighbors in North America. As neighboring countries in North America. And we can live in peace and we can be have we can have a better relationship with each other. And a perfect example, and I keep bringing it up, is Czechoslovakia. In 1993, Czechoslovakia broke up through a velvet divorce. That's what it's called. Velvet divorce into the present-day countries of the Czech Republic and Slovakia. To this day, they remain peaceful neighbors. And they also have a mutual defense agreement with each other. So in that example of national divorce, where the actual term of divorce was used to describe what happened in that country, they have and maintain good relations to this day, decades later, and they have mutual defense agreement, decades later. That will happen in North America, where the people of Texas, the people of California, no longer interfering with each other's affairs, no longer... Uh, in each other's hair, no, no longer bothering each other with their different cultural and, val uh, and, and, and ideological value systems. Free to do and pursue the public policy preferences that each respective population wants in their own state or their own country, let's call it. Now the people of California, the people of Texas can live and, and cohabitate in North America in peace and work together. And find common ground on the global issues that matter. Because we're no longer going to be at each other's throats about the domestic issues and the cultural battles that we've been fighting for so many years. So anyway, today I wanted to really focus on not just national divorce, but particularly I wanted to go, and I'm going to go through several of these articles, but not all today. But today I'm going to focus on one article that was published recently in the National Review. The author of the article, Rich Lowry, published a National Review on October 8th, two days ago, with the grand headline, 
National divorce is a poisonly stupid idea. Well, let's see why he thinks that uh, it's a poisonously stupid idea. And again, I, my name is Louis Marinelli. If you're just turning in, I'm the California secessionist running for governor in California on the platform of national divorce. First candidate in history to do so. But now I'm going to go through some of these points and dissect this article because this is this is misinformation. And I think someone needs to address it. So why not? Why not I? And so let us begin. So Mr. Lowry starts off here saying right off the bat that divorce is usually isn't a good idea. Well, I think that divorce is often a good idea, a necessary idea. I don't know where Mr. Lowry lives, where he thinks that divorce is usually not a good idea. I think that divorce is often a good idea. First of all, because a lot of people get married for the wrong reasons and end up regretting it. Secondly, a lot of times we have situations where there's domestic violence, which is certainly a valid, good idea to have a divorce in those cases. And we have, over the last several decades, uh, liberalized our divorce laws in the country simply because we recognize that divorce is something that's a part of our life. And couples ought to be free to uh, terminate their divorce, even if there are no faults. That's what no-fault divorce is. And so right off the bat, Mr. Lowry, starting off with divorce usually isn't a good idea. That's especially true of a nearly 250-year-old continental nation. Well, you're wrong, Mr. Lowry. Divorce often is a good idea, unfortunately, simply because a lot of times people shouldn't have gotten married uh, to that particular person in the first place. So anyway, Mr. Lowry goes on to say, and I was talking about this before, that, you know, uh, There's no doubt that the country is deeply divided, and he's accepting the premise of national divorce by saying that the country is divided politically, culturally, religiously. But he says that national divorce is not the solution. He says that the obstacles are insurmountable and that the likely effects would be very unwelcome to its proponents. So he's saying that, for example, people like me who promote national uh, divorce would end up not liking the result of that. Okay, well, let's see what he's talking about that. Goes on to talk about, you know, insufficient patriotism is one of the ills of contemporary America. Well, let me ask you out there. Is there a reason if you're someone my age, and I'm 35, someone my age or younger, what is the reason for that person to feel a sense of patriotism? in the United States. And I don't think, I can't think of a reason why anyone, any American citizen my age or younger should feel any feeling of patriotism. What has our country done in our lifetime for which we should be proud? I mean, we could talk about things that the country did way back when, and there's things to be proud of historically fighting the Nazis in World War II, helping to defeat the Nazis in World War II, because, again, we have to recognize the fact that the United States did not win World War II. It was a, it was a, it was a team effort, so to speak, and, and the Soviets did just as much, and if more. In fact, they did do more than the Americans did. So anyway, we can be proud of the fact that we contributed towards the defeat of fascism in Europe in the 1940s. We can be proud of the fact that we sent a man to the moon and returned him safely to the earth, as President Kennedy challenged our nation to do in the 1960s. But I was born in the 1980s. So if anybody's out there and can leave a comment telling me or anybody who was born in my generation, 1980 and beyond, 1970 and beyond, 
what has the United States done for which someone like me, my age, should be proud? And to go back to Mr. Lowry's article here, he talks about the fact that, you know, the United States is going to be instantly less powerful. Indeed, Russia and China, and I talked about this before in my blog, that people who, who oppose national divorce don't really have much to say in favor of the actual union. Like, they can't say we should stay together because the country works so well, or the government works so effectively, or we have such a great democracy, or our, our, our population and our people are so united. They don't have any arguments in favor of the actual union. All they start doing is looking outward and saying, well... You know, Russia and China will be delighted if we have a national divorce. That's what he said in his article, National Review. Russia and China would be delighted and presumably believe that we deserve to experience the equivalent of a crack-up of the Soviet Union. Well, frankly speaking, I think that many people would agree with that. Not just the Soviets and the Chinese, but a lot of Americans would agree with the fact that we deserve the equivalent of a crack-up of the Soviet Union simply because of the fact that the United States, the Republic, the American Republic has grown beyond its means. It's expanded around the world. It's an empire now. The United States is an empire. And so when you become an empire, you have to recognize the fact that empires, empires rise and they fall. And there was a study done, and a historian once, once said that the average lifespan of an empire on planet Earth is about 245 years. So of course, some of them are longer, some of them are much shorter, but the average lifespan of an empire in our world, in America, in, 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 in human history, is 245 years. The United States is just about that age. So we grew from a, from a fledgling country on the eastern seaboard through manifest destiny. We conquered North America. Let's not even get into how that happened. And we conquered Hawaii, and we, we purchased Alaska, and now we have military bases all around the world in every continent except Antarctica. It's an empire. The United States is an empire. And, and it's not like it's a benevolent empire because most people around the world, I would say, would believe that the United States is is a problem for them. Comes into other countries, comes into other continents, takes other countries' resources, flies their drones on top of their cities and drops bombs and kills their family members. Look what the Biden administration just did in retaliation for that attack on American troops at the Afghanistan airport in Kabul. Took their drone and just dropped a bomb on the first person they could see and tried to blame them and say it was a terrorist. So not only is the United States an empire, but the power that we yield overseas has been used to a large respect in very atrocious ways. And so, yes, I believe, and many people believe, not just Americans, but also around the world, not just the Russians and the Chinese, that the United States empire deserves to fall. And perhaps from that fall could be reborn the idea of republic and federalism. Or what people like I am suggesting is that we go through a national divorce, we agree to disagree, we split up the assets, we share the debts, and we peacefully part ways. That's what national divorce is about. But beyond that, the Russia and China, this idea that Russia and China, you know, we, we break up and all of a sudden they're so happy about that. Why, why, why is it that Russia and China would, would like that? Russia and China in any country, as I wrote about this on my blog, are interested in having stable relationships with the United States. They want predictable and stable relationships with the United States. And if the United States were to break up, from which we would create several different countries. You know, we would have automatically, or not we would, but the Chinese and the Russians would automatically have a number of new countries in North America, all from a common American root, 
So there's a lot of common ground there, a lot of uh, common heritage and history and values, Western values, and they all have their own foreign policies now. And so as a result of that, now Russia, who generally understands the United States, its positions, where it stands, what it's willing to stand up against, what it's willing to stand up for, you know, how it's going to react in certain situations, what cards it holds in its hands. The United, Russia and China, they understand these things. And they, they use that information that they understand to form their foreign policies and to decide what actions they're going to take and what actions they're going to avoid uh, in the world. And all of a sudden, you're going you're gonna to get rid of the United States, something that's a known quantity, and that they can predict it. And all of a sudden, you're going to have the Republic of Texas and the Republic of California, and maybe Cascadia in the Northwest. Maybe in the Northeast, you have New Hampshire and other states join together for some kind of federation that reflects their values. They're going to have to reassess their entire world strategy from from square one. How is that in Russia and China's interest? Yeah, sure, they might have some kind of moral victory and they're going to be, you know, you know, celebrating a moral victory that the United States has broken apart just like they did in the 1990s. But beyond that, the next day when they wake up, they got a big problem. All of a sudden they need to assess what's going on in North America. All of a sudden they need to assess, you know, are these new countries in North America, is it going to be another European Union? That's basically what it could very well end up being like. North America could end up being like the European Union. European, European Union. Europe has 44 countries. And generally speaking, they're friendly with each other. They're allied with each other. There's NATO. There's the EU. There's other international organizations. They all work together. There's nothing to say that an American national divorce means that these new countries are, are going to fold up their arms and never going to talk to each other. No, it's the opposite. That's what's happening now. National divorce, on the, on the other hand, gets rid of that animosity, gets rid of the division, and allows us to get out of each other's domestic affairs and then work together to find common ground on other issues, on global issues. And so national divorce is actually the, the method through which we can come closer together and be stronger on the international stage where we can find common ground to challenge Russia. We can find common ground to, to challenge the Chinese because look at the same thing with China. You know, China has a predictable opponent, a predictable adversary in the United States. You're gonna throw in new countries, Texas, California, Washington, New Hampshire, other countries from the, the heartland. And all of a sudden now China's gonna be dealing with countries that may be more willing to take them on when it comes to environmental issues, human rights issues, labor issues. Whereas right now, Washington doesn't do such a good job at that, do they? Now all of a sudden, China, who this 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 idea, this notion out there that all of a sudden China is going to celebrate to break up the United States, all of a sudden China has a number of countries that may be willing to stand up and challenge them economically and on their human rights record, which they should do, by the way, and I support it. In fact, that's why I bring that up, because California certainly as an independent country, would take a hard line approach on China when it comes to environmental issues, when it comes to uh, labor issues, and the way that they uh, produce products that are consumed by Americans, and other human rights issues. California certainly would stand up and require the Chinese to, to improve their record in those, in those fronts before we sign trade deals with them and cooperate with them in other fronts, certainly. And we should. That's not the same... Or at least the same could not be said about Texas, for example. So certainly there's going to be various unique approaches when it comes to foreign policy of these new countries that form out of a national divorce. And that's going to not and that's going to be in, in China or Russia's favor. That's just that doesn't make any sense. I'm trying to go through some of the comments here and uh try to keep up with them as we go. So yeah, basically, Russia and China would not be delighted by this breakup of the United States. And there are other reasons why as well, and I laid them out in my in my blog post on my website, lewismarinelli.com. But I wanted to continue on because this article continues on to some more nonsense that I think needs to be addressed. 
And one of those points is uh, what Mr. Lowry was saying is all of a sudden the economic consequences would be severe because the United States is a continent-wide free trade zone. And that by breaking up, all of a sudden we balkanized the country and, and what? All of a sudden we, we, we're all drawn, you know, building barbed wire fences on our borders, blocking off our highways and railways with each other, taking our toys and going home and 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 never talking to each other once again. And there's no basis for that. Look at Europe again. Europe, 44 countries. Free trade, free movement, freedom of movement, free, the Schengen visa-free area, for example. People of France can go to Germany. People of Germany can go to Italy, Switzerland. They can travel around for, for freely. No visas. I, I don't think there are even borders anymore. You can just travel. You don't even have to get your passport stamped. There's nothing to say that we can't replicate that in North America, where we can have our own independent country, where we can handle our own domestic affairs and set our own foreign policies that matches our value system in each individual respective country. But between the states, between the countries, freedom of movement so that people in California can go to Las Vegas as they do on the weekends. Uh, people in, in New York, the Yankees fans, can go up to Fenway Park in Boston to watch the baseball game. I don't know where this fear is all of a sudden that national divorce means that, you know, we just, you know, put up blockades on our highways and shut down the connections of trade. You know, we're going to still have commerce in North America, interstate commerce, but it actually now be international commerce and it can still be free trade. I'm not saying it has to be free trade, but we had something called NAFTA, which was the North American Free Trade Agreement. And it was with Canada, it was with Mexico, United States. Why couldn't there be, if there was the desire for free trade, to be another version of NAFTA, which included the countries that result or get created out of a national divorce? So again, this idea, this uh, oh, we're going to have a national divorce and we're going to stop trade, and we're going to stop commerce, and there's going to be there's going to be disaster. It's not true. We're still going to have free trade if we want it. We're still going to have the freedom of movement if we want it. Nobody's building up walls uh, between the borders. It's just it's just ridiculous and it's nonsense. So, Mr. Lowry, anyway, continues with his. Uh, Nonsense about national divorce. Bring up Abraham Lincoln. Brings up Abraham Lincoln. He's talking about how, you know, Mr. Lincoln says here, finally, the United States foundering on its domestic divisions would be a significant blow to the prestige of liberal democracy. Abraham Lincoln worried about this effect the first time around, and it might even be worse now with a long, stable republic unable to survive internal dissension. Well, since you bring it up, Mr. Lincoln, I would remind you that perhaps his most well-known quote is that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And that is as true today as it was back then. In fact, although the house that we live in in this United States, this proverbial house that we live in in the United States, is not divided along the same lines as it was in the 1800s leading up to the Civil War, it's still very much divided against itself on different lines, deeper lines. We're not talking now about a division between simply states' rights, you know, nationalism versus the state's pride and allegiance to one state. We're talking about some, as you yourself, Mr. Lowe, said, political and religious and cultural differences that are very deep in our society. And somehow we're just going to come to the table and try to work it out. No, the house that we live in, this proverbial house that we live in under the same roof is divided against itself and cannot stand. And we need a national divorce so that everyone can live under their own roof and set the policies that they want under their own roof. And then when visitors come into their country, they can tell them that as long as you're under my roof, you're going to follow the laws that I feel necessary to have in this house. 
But anyway, let's continue. Again, Mr. Lowry, and not only Mr. Lowry, I'm, I'm picking on Mr. Lowry right now, but he's also echoed several of the arguments uh, other people have made. And, and one of them is that, you know, we can't have a national divorce because we can't just draw the lines like we could during the Civil War. For example, we could draw, you know, the border along the Mason-Dixon line, which is a relatively straight line, divides the North and the South. And if we were going to divide the country, that would be the time to do it. We have a straight line. Now with migration and now with uh, the expansion of the United States and different borders have been created, all of a sudden now it's not possible to have a national divorce because we'd be drawing lines here and there and everywhere. And it would be a mess. I agree. That would be a mess. But I also agree that we don't need to approach this issue like we did during the Civil War, where we tried to break apart based on state lines. There's no reason for us in 2021 to divide the country up along existing state lines. The idea of national divorce is not one of a division in this country that, you know, the people of California are more, uh, relate more with California than they do with the United States. So the people of Florida and Texas relate more with their state than they do with the United States. And so they have this state pride and state allegiance more than they do allegiance to the United States. And therefore, they want to break their state away from the country. What we're talking about is a national divorce based on political, cultural, religious differences and diametrically opposed worldviews. And what we need to do as a country is to take some data. Now we're in the 21st century, information age. We can take data. We can take data from previous elections, presidential, Senate, House elections, state assembly elections, state Senate elections, county results from elections. We can overlay all that information and sort of get a good picture about, okay, where is red America? Where is blue America? And then from that information, and we can throw other information in there as well. If we take, for example, information from the census, we can take all that information together and really kind of analyze what lines would make sense to draw. We don't have to, you know, cut California off along its existing lines. It would make no sense to do so. The whole northern part of the state hates California. You know, the people who want to create the state of Jefferson, they hate California. Why would we drag them out? Uh, of the union with with us when they hate us let them go to oregon join with oregon let them join with nevada create their 51st state of jefferson if they want to i mean national divorces is, is in everyone's interest in that way because i as someone who disagrees with both democrats and republicans can understand that neither side wants to live with each other so why would we as a state take the borders that we have today and secede from the union through national divorce and then take a bunch of conservatives who are patriotic Americans along with us? Let them stay if that's what they want to do. Same holds true in other states. So what we have to have is, you know, a series of votes. If you want to, if you want, where, where you want to, what, you, what part of the country you want to associate with. It's voluntary association. And we can divide the lines in ways that make sense. And so it's not going to be easy. We're not going to be able to just, you know, have a meeting one day and take out a map and start drawing lines. You know, I'm not talking about that. Certainly, it's going to be a long process. And it's going to require a lot of experts to weigh in on the issue. Experts, political experts, geography experts, economical experts. And we can all sit down because this is an area... And I think it's the only and the last area where we can find common ground. And that's why I believe it's possible for us to have an amicable national divorce, because this is an area where we can see that we can agree to disagree. And if the result of a national divorce is that the left gets to live in a country that reflects their values and the right gets to live in a country that reflects their values, then for a few years we can come and sit down at the table and work it out and make it happen. Because otherwise we know that we're going to be bickering and fighting with no end. So it's for that reason, I believe, that we can make it happen and that we can make it happen peacefully. And it could be an amicable national divorce with a settlement that works 
for all sides to the best extent possible. You know, and then, you know, Mr. Lowry continues on here in his article in, in, the, in the National Review, just like other authors as well. He's not the first one. He doesn't really have any of his own uh, grand, unique ideas here. But, you know, he's repeating and parroting a lot of the other articles that were written throughout the last couple of weeks about this topic. And one of the things he talks about how it's, you know, it's not possible to do so because we've drawn these lines and you have inevitably you're going to have Republicans end up in some liberal countries and some liberals are going to end up in the Republican countries. And so it defeats the purpose. Well, I don't think it defeats the purpose at all because politically motivated migration is nothing new. I mean, we have it now. We have it right now. And we're not even going through the national divorce right now. Right now, there are Californians, conservatives in California who are leaving the state for Arizona, Texas, Idaho, because they don't agree with the politics of California, which is making California more and more liberal because there's fewer and fewer conservatives. There are mass migration from, from the northern states and northeast and the Rust Belt moving down south, looking for, even, if it's just, even if it's just for better climate. Migration is a natural thing that happens in a country. And politically motivated migration is nothing new. And it's been happening since the invention of the wheel, which allowed them to migrate faster. Because we've had, for example, North America. Why are we here in North America? We're here in North America because it was, it was settled and colonized by Europeans who came to North America, to the so-called New World, in search of a new opportunity to live their lives free from religious and political persecution. Let us not forget that the people who first came to North America from Europe came here through political migration in search of freedom of religion and to escape political persecution. So they were doing it back then, and they crossed the ocean in a wooden ship. And we're going to say now in the 21st century that through national divorce, after national divorce, we're not going to be able to manage to relocate if that's what we want to do. If you end up being a, a liberal voter left behind enemy lines, so to speak, in a conservative state, you're, in the, in the, you're not comfortable there. You're not going to be able to manage to cross the border and go live somewhere else. We got planes now, we got trains, automobiles, we got rocket ships now. You got people going to space, space tourism. You got many opportunities for you to travel to one of these new countries that we create through national divorce. And if that's what's going to make you happy, then that's what you'll do. But that's not to say that you have to. A lot of people who will, quote unquote, end up behind enemy lines might just stay there because they're not political. They're just going to live their lives. Not everybody's so political. I mean, to a growing extent, people are very political, but I mean, not everybody is political. And a lot of people will just be able to get on with their lives after national divorce without having to migrate. But inevitably, some people will migrate, and that's fine. People are migrating now. People are always migrating. You know, I moved to Russia back in 2016 because I didn't want to live under the administration of Hillary Clinton. It was one of the big reasons why I moved. That was political migration. I did not want to live under a Clinton administration, and she was basically the anointed one, and we were ready for her to win. If Donald Trump won. It was a surprise. Nobody was expecting Donald Trump to win. Not even Donald Trump. So let's not pretend that politically motivated migration is something new and it's not going to be possible through or after national divorce. And, you know, Mr. Lowry brought up another interesting point. Let me see if I can find it in his article because he keeps talking and repeating uh, so many points made in other articles. But here he's talking about, here's a good question. He asks, who gets control of the federal government? Well, I, I think that Mr. Lowry doesn't understand national divorce because after the national divorce, the states break up and they're independent countries. I don't think there's going to be a federal government anymore. That's kind of the point. I mean, it's kind of the point. One of the biggest reasons why people want a national divorce is because of the federal government. And it's 
inability to govern and its massive expansion and the gridlock in Washington and the corruption in our system of government and the lack of faith in our systems, in our institutions. Who gets control of the federal government? Well, I don't think there's going to be many people vying for control of the federal government. Nobody, nobody likes the federal government. Who's going to get control of the federal government? It's not going to exist, Mr. Lowry. That's the point. National divorce ends the federal government. It creates each new country gets their own federal government. Sacramento, for example, is a state government. Through Calixit and through national divorce, California becomes an independent country. That government establishment in Sacramento becomes a, quote-unquote, federal government. And in the case of California, that won't be such a bad thing because California is one of the few states in the country that currently has an equivalent state agency or program or organization that basically matches and duplicates the work of a similar federal agency. So what that means is that when this federal government ceases to exist through national divorce, that California's state government ascends into the role of a federal government, we already have the political infrastructure there. We have agencies to manage health care, education, the parks, and everything else that you can imagine. So there's not going to be a lot of work there for California in terms of creating new agencies and 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 organizations and jobs and uh, so on and so forth so that we can manage the state of California as a country. That infrastructure already exists in California. Now, that's not true for all the other states necessarily. But California is unique in that way that there are almost on a one-to-one -one basis an equivalent state agency for each federal agency in the United States. So that makes me ask Mr. Lowry the question, what federal government are you talking about? I think you're missing the point of national divorce because through national divorce, there is no federal government except the ones that we create in these new countries. And those federal governments will be more reflective and representative of their populations because the populations will be more politically homogenous. What that means is that in California, we're going to have a federal government that represents Californians. Californians have a common ideological and, and mindset, and that federal government will reflect that. In Texas, they'll have a different federal government that will reflect the people of Texas and Texan values. And that's the point. So we're almost done here. I want to get into this last thing because he does bring up, okay, one of the serious questions that, of course, he's going to bring up, but everybody has to bring it up. And let's talk about it. I mean, the assets and the debts, you know, through as through any divorce, the assets and the debts are shared and divided. And so that would be the case through natural divorce as well. He asked, for example, Mr. Lowry asked, for example, in his article, he says, you know, who gets the 1.3 million people under arms and a stockpile of 3,800 nuclear warheads? Would it be the red states or the blue states, et cetera? Well, California, all the states in some way have contributed to the economic success of the United States throughout its history. And all the states in their own ways have benefited from spending at the federal level throughout its history. And so it only makes sense that all of the states would acquire a, a fair share of the assets that we've developed and, and acquired throughout time and also the debts that we have accrued throughout time. And so it's a simple answer, but of course it's not a simple solution, but it's a simple answer. Who gets what we have? Well, we split it up. Whether it be an asset or a debt, we split it up. We share it. We could do it, for example, on a per capita basis. That's just an example. I'm not saying that has to be the way that we would do it, but that's an example. Whereas, for example, 40 million Californians would take a larger share of the national debt than, say, the 600,000 people who live up in Wyoming. 
likewise, we would get a larger portion of the assets that the country has. It's military assets. It's financial assets. All of that would be in some way, in a fair way, in proportional way, divided and shared between our populations. So that's a simple answer. Yet people make it a, a tough question. It's not a tough question to answer. Now, of course, hashing out the particular details will require some negotiation and time. But the actual abstract answer to that is very simple. The assets and the debts would be divided and shared. And that would be part of a national divorce settlement. And the last thing I wanted to talk about here, because again, it repeats kind of the same idea of what Mr. Lowry said earlier about the federal government. The federal government's going to cease to exist through national divorce. That's like the number one benefit of national divorce. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. It's one of the greatest things that could result from a national divorce is that the federal government ceases to exist because the federal government is the biggest problem that we all have in this country. So in that light, he brings up the Electoral College. And he says that, uh, you know, if Texas were to secede, for example, it would, you know, how, you know, how would it, you know, how is the rest of the country going to work without Texas in the Electoral College, for example? You know, he says, let's say Texas left. That's 40 Electoral College off the map, national map for Republicans. But that's different from national divorce. First of all, that's different from national divorce. Texas leaving while the rest of the country remains intact is different from national divorce. That is Texas secession, Texit. And that's a different question. Just like CalExit, for example. You know, I'm the president of Yes California. We founded CalExit. We started using national divorce language back in 2016, 17. But CalExit is different from national divorce in the respect that it's only about California. Or Texas and Texit is only about Texas secession. But national divorce, which can be combined together with these independence movements in each state, means that this federal system is going to cease to exist because there are going to be new countries established once we split the country up. And so we don't have the Electoral College. So the Electoral College ceases to exist after national divorce, which is also a great thing. It's also a great thing. That's, I mean, that the federal government ceases to exist and that the Electoral College ceases to exist are two good things that result from a national divorce. And that what we could do in a result of that, at the end of that, is to say that in California or in Texas, for example, Mr. Lowry brings up Texas. What happens now? Well, in, and it happens now is that Texans elect the president of Texas in a way that reflects their value system. Maybe it's a national vote, national direct popular vote. Maybe it's, uh, uh, you know, they reestablish some electoral college system of their own. Maybe they create a new idea. Maybe they establish a parliament and the prime minister is elected by the parliament. It's up to them. And in California, for example, we could do what we feel is best. And that's the point, is that we can do what we feel is best for California. And the people of Texas can do what they feel is best for the people of Texas. And the people of the other states can do what they feel is in the best interest of their states. And those states that are not able to be completely self-sufficient on their own can join together with other states neighboring states and create federations or confederations or unions of their own, a block of countries, for example, Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, Missouri, they can join together. You know, there's only a number of states in the union that really could go it alone. And that would be, for example, California, the fifth largest economy in the world, Texas, also top 10 global economy. But not all the states could, could manage that on their own. So inevitably, some of them, smaller ones in size, or the ones with the small populations, could join together with the neighboring countries to form a larger, more expansive country. And that makes sense. And they should do that. But let's talk about the Electoral College for a minute before we go here. Just to answer the question that Mr. Lowry brings up in his, in his article in the National Review. Texas is 40 electoral votes off the electoral map for the Republicans. Well, 
let's put it like this. I'm not so sure about Texas electoral history, but I do know about California's electoral history. And I do know that, for example, let's change Texas to California. If California leaves and we take our 55 electoral votes off the map for the Democrats, right? Well, that doesn't really change anything because we know through history and presidential elections, we know that California's electoral votes have not affected the result of an election since the 1800s. How can I say that? Well, if we look at 2020, for example, Joe Biden had over 300 electoral votes. Trump had 230, 232. The gap between them is larger than the number of electoral votes that California brings to the table. So even without California in the equation, Joe Biden still won. And go back to 2016, Donald Trump that time had about 300 and something electoral votes, and Hillary Clinton had 230 something electoral votes. It's also larger gap than the number of electoral college votes California brings to the table. So therefore, we didn't affect that election either. And that election, we voted for Hillary Clinton. So she just would have lost by a larger margin, but she still would have lost. Go back to Barack Obama's two elections. He won California. He still would have won without California because he won by gaps, or, you know, margins that are larger than the number of electoral votes that California has. George Bush, he got elected twice. He lost California both times. But he won by a, a margin without California larger than the number of votes. So the people who lost, you know, uh, who was it there? It was Al Gore and it was uh, John Kerry. They just would have lost by even more. And so California's electoral votes, and we have 55 of them, or maybe it's changed now because of the new census. I, I don't recall. We haven't affected the result of an election since the 1800s, because if you go back to each presidential election, you see that the person who won, won by a margin larger than the number of electoral votes that California brings to the table, or they won with California. So the same thing is likely true for Texas because they have even fewer electoral votes. And those gaps between who wins presidential elections are 60, 70 votes every time. And when was the last time we had an electoral college vote that was, you know, 272 to 268? And, that, uh, and what happened was that the person, you know, and that California's electoral votes made the difference there. You have to look it up. It wasn't uh, any time recent. And so... National divorce, long story short, no more electoral college, and that's a good thing. But even if it was, for example, we're talking about just California secession. People say a lot of times, well, California can't secede because we'll leave the rest of the country to uh, Republican presidents forever. Well, that's not true, as I've just explained. And I would also point out that even with California's electoral votes, the country still elected somebody like Donald Trump, still elected twice George W. Bush. And we will see in 2024 how Donald Trump may very well return to the White House based on the way things are going now. I think it is very possible that Donald Trump can return to the White House in 2024 because what we are going to see in 2022 is a red wave that will bring the Congress back under the control of the Republican Party both the House of Representatives and the Senate. We see the current president's poll numbers tanking, absolutely tanking. He may not even finish his first term. But even if he does, and he's up for re-election in 2024 against Donald Trump, he's not going to have much of a record to stand on. And if he resigns before then and it's Kamala Harris, the country doesn't like Kamala Harris either. And so it's going to be Donald Trump. Back in the White House, 2024, unless things start changing. And that's why it's so important that in next year's California governor election, we elect in California a governor who is prepared to take California along the path towards independence from the United States, to prepare to bring about a Cal exit, and to be a part of the negotiations in favor of a national divorce. Because if we elect, for example, or re-elect Gavin Newsom, 
He has presidential ambitions. He has a personal interest in the United States continuing to exist because he wants to be its president. But we need a governor in California who is prepared to take California along the path it needs to independence. Because what's going to happen when Donald Trump gets reelected in 2024? And we have Gavin Newsom as governor. Gavin Newsom is not going to stand up and say California needs to secede from the union. We need a governor who will stand up and say that. And we need a governor who from day one in 2023 will initiate that process so that we are prepared in 2024 when Donald Trump wins in November. And we are prepared in January 2025 when he takes office to already be on our way out. We need to be prepared. We need an exit plan, an exit strategy, and we can't be trying to play catch up in 2024 and 2025 because we reelected Gavin Newsom. So realistically, we would be waiting off until 2026 to be able to start that process. Two years under the next president's term. Two years under the Donald Trump's next term. And we're still haven't even taken the first steps towards independence, first steps towards a national divorce. We need a governor who is going to start from day one in office to put California on the path towards independence because we will, whether it's in 2024 or later on, we will have another Donald Trump or Donald Trump-like president. We will have another president of the United States who will be diametrically opposed to California's values, and we will need to take action to protect our people and to protect our state from the growth of these problems in Washington. And the sooner we can start developing that exit strategy, the better. And that's why I'm running for governor. That's why I'm coming back to California to run for governor, to put myself on that ballot as an alternative to the Democratic establishment in California, to vow, if elected governor, to put California on the path towards independence, to start developing that exit strategy. And so that means that in 2022, with me on that ballot, the next governor election in 2022 is not going to just be an election between two politicians or even two political parties who are vying for power in Sacramento for their own personal uh, political ambition or two political parties that are vying for power in, in Sacramento to institute their own political platform. It's going to be a choice election between statehood and nationhood. And I believe that no establishment Democrat, no establishment politician in California will stand a chance if they're forced to go out and campaign against California independence for governor. If they're going to have to travel around the state of California and tell people why they don't deserve for California to be an independent country. Let's have Gavin Newsom go out there and tell the people of California why they don't deserve independence, why they should stay in this broken union, in this dysfunctional government, and bend the knee to Washington and remain at risk of the growth of fascism in the United States. Let's have Gavin Newsom go around the state and convince the people of California that they need to continue to bend the knee, and they need to suck it up, and they need to continue to live in a country that doesn't reflect their values. He will do that, and he will lose. And that's what my campaign, and that's what my candidacy represents. I thank you for your attention. I'll be back with episode three as we continue to talk about national divorce, and we continue to talk about the governor election next year, and we continue to talk about these issues that are important to the people of California. This is Louis Marinelli, the California Secessionist. Have a nice day. I will see you next time.